Okay, it says meeting recording in progress. So we should be recording. All right, so I'll call the May 26, 2020 Ward Public Housing Agency board meeting to order. Uh, my name is Greg Lemke. I'm the cha uh, current chair of the Housing Authority. Our meeting today uh, is being held uh, on video conference due to COVID-19. The public may not attend in person based on Minnesota Executive Order 20-01. Recording of the meeting will be posted on the City of Moorhead's webpage following the meeting. There is time reserved on the agenda for citizens to be heard. Any citizens to be heard can address the board by calling 218-299-5463. Um, if the rest of the board members and other people who will be um, partaking in the meeting today would just like to introduce yourself, first and last name and your position. Michael Carbone, co-chair. Alexa Dixon, Secretary. Hi, this is Don Bacon. I'm the Executive Director with Moorhead Public Housing. And in the room with me is Tony Vondal, our Housing Manager, who's taking minutes for the meeting. We also have Cynthia Yuen on the line. Cynthia is a consultant that we're working on with our repositioning work. So she'll be here for that portion of the meeting. And it looks like we also have our council liaison, Shelly Dahlquist, uh, joining us today. Um, first item on our agenda then is the approval of the minutes from the April 28th, 2020 meeting. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Second item is a request approval for payment of bills. Um, for payment of bills this month, um, the only thing that's unusual um, is an elevator payment for the Riverview Heights elevator modernization project. Um, and that is reflected in the capital fund line. It was a little over $100,000. Um, but sh it should be noted that that $100,000 came through our POHP program with the state of Minnesota. So the money came from the state to our bank account and then right out um, with a check to the contractor. Um, all the other expenses reported are fairly routine and predictable. Any questions for Don? For the bills? none i'll entertain a motion to approve i move for payment of uh, bills <clears throat> a second I have a motion and a second any further discussion hearing none all those in favor aye i aye. oppose motion carries any agenda amendments i have no amendments okay no agenda amendments the next item is citizens to be heard Again, the phone number is 218-299-5463. And Greg, we haven't received any phone calls um, at this point. Um, people would have been notified, you know, of their ability to call in through our postings, um, both on our website and in the different building locations. But no one has called in at this time. Okay, if you would just let us know if somebody does. So we'll move on to business then. The first uh, item is repositioning and budget trends, and this is an information only item. So this item, typically we put our votes first and then our other business for presentations later, but we thought it would be, um, it would make more sense to have this item um, come before our um, actual operating budget presentation for our proposed operating budget for the future year. Um, this information is about um how we are seeing trends happen over time so it's not the numbers you're going to be looking at aren't specific to our current operating budget or proposed operating budget it's more looking at all the resources that the agency has across our public housing program as well as our capital funding program and looking at um, the expenses compared to the revenue um, and based on our projections um, how we're looking and and how that is considered into looking at repositioning um, as an option for the public housing program. As I mentioned earlier, I do have Cynthia Ewan on the call. So I worked with Cynthia on this document. And I do want to just make sure you can see the screen that I'm sharing right now. It's our board packet. 
Yes. Yeah. Great. So I'm just going to scroll down to that document. So this is just a short two page. Um, as you remember, last month, um, Cynthia and I presented to you a basic proposed process for the technical assistance grant that we received with the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund and with Minnesota NARO to look at the topic of repositioning our public housing program um, and phase one being looking specifically at our 30 scattered sites. Um, and again, repositioning of public housing is merely looking at some different options available under HUD um, to change um, to a different affordable housing program that's different from the public housing program that will continue to offer affordability for residents, um, but provide um, more stable, um, dependable funding for the agency so that we can continue to offer um, housing for individuals in the long term. And so a big part of that conversation um, is looking at our agency um, sustainability and funding. Um, and so you can see on the annual budget here, you see a, a graph for both revenue and expenses. Um, and this is a general average projection. So um, we looked at um, current year and previous year um, for our operating subsidy and took an average um, for the capital funding grant. I took an average of the last four years. Um, we never know exactly what that number is going to be from year to year. Um, sometimes it declines, other times it goes up. Um, overall, we've seen declines in revenue. Um, and then our rent revenue as well. So you can see the different sections in our revenue um, and the different sections in our expenses for the public housing program. Now, these numbers are specific to all of our public housing programs. So while in phase one, we're looking at repositioning options specific to the scattered site locations, um, I am presenting information across the entire program for you. Um, because the way that we organize our finances is really all under one umbrella. Um, and so that's the best way to look at it. So on average, our expenses are exceeding revenue by around $36,000 per year. Um, we do have a capital needs backlog. This is a common problem with housing agencies across the country. Um, and we recently did a physical needs assessment um, where we looked at all of our public housing properties. Um, and so these numbers come out of that physical needs assessment that was done by a third party that we hired. And you can see um, looking at our apartment buildings, um, the immediate need, um, and we did break out the scattered site um, amount for immediate need. Um, those two numbers together, we're looking at 1.8 million dollars in immediate capital needs, um, as well as in the next one to five years, an additional 2.5 million. Um, so again, when we're thinking about what is our deficit in terms of um, funding per year, also adding on top of that, that we have aging infrastructure and buildings um, that have unmet needs. Um, those are the challenges that we Face as an agency. We do have an opportunity that we're anticipating um, will be approved by HUD. Um, we have not heard yet, um, and but we've talked about um, the transfer of some public housing inventory um, that Clay County Ho Housing and Redevelopment Authority is no longer um, using, and how if that's transferred to Moorhead Public Housing, that will help us access additional dollars over the next five years um, and the agency can decide you know what we want to do with that um, certainly i think capital needs improvements um, will be on the forefront of the list so we wanted to add that as a resource on this handout um, for the board to keep in mind when we're looking at you know where are the need areas and then where are the resources So to summarize, we just work together, Cynthia and I, to break it down into some very succinct points around when we think about our budget um, and our budget trend really from year to year and, and where the agency stands big picture. And we look at repositioning as an opportunity 
um, what do we need the board to really be considering? And um, you know, one is that our expenses are regularly exceeding our revenue. Um, our rent revenue has been overreported in the past um, with tenant charges going into uh, rent revenue that's been um, corrected. Um, but that did result in, in less HUD funding in some recent years. Um, we have since rectified that, but that did, we, we built that into our projection with the revenue. The second takeaway is that our agency reserves have been our cushion. And I know we've had quite a bit of discussion about our agency reserves. We've been fortunately in a position of fairly strong reserves, um, but we also know that we can't rely on that as a as a solution. It's more of a cushion um, to buy us some time to make some changes as an agency to be um, in a better, more stable funding position. The backlog of, of capital needs um, across our entire portfolio. Um, and while some improvements can be postponed in interim, they still need to be addressed. And as a public housing agency, that's definitely a topic that we wrestle with a lot. Um, so you may see the expected useful life be 25 years. The way we operate, we have to look at, is there a way to push that beyond the 25 years? Because we simply do not have the, the resources to replace everything at its kind of typical depreciation level, um, which also gets into good preventative maintenance and how that can be a strategy to um, use resources as, ex as efficiently as possible. The Clay County HRA transfer of funding. Um, so again, following HUD approval, we, we should be hearing in a matter of days, because I believe they have to tell us um, by June 1st, which is 30 days before our new fiscal year. Um, and as of July 1, if, if that was approved by HUD, which I do anticipate it will be, the agency would have immediate access to approximately $102,000 um, with, further funding coming throughout the next five years that would need to be spent specifically on our public housing program. So if we do reposition the scattered sites, those dollars from the clay transfer could not be used post position, they reposition, they could be used prior to repositioning to make capital needs improvement. Another way to think about it is we are directing a lot of capital funding grant money right now to our scattered sites to get them ready to reposition. Um, and so this extra funding from clay can help offset um, those resources that were directed towards the scattered sites to attend to issues at the apartments, should we decide to reposition those scattered sites. And then finally, repositioning will allow for an increase in revenue. Um, this is probably reflects an area that I spent the most time on in the last month um, to work really hard on giving you my best estimate on how much revenue we can anticipate coming in uh, more than what we're getting now for those scattered sites. Um, I have adjusted my projection down from 92,000 to 77,000 per year. Um, but hearing those numbers, those are still really large numbers in terms of added revenue to the agency. Um, and it really varies based, one of the challenging parts is the current rent that tenant pays is based on who's in that unit and what their income is. And so we have to constantly be looking at that estimate, but you can see it's, it's substantial in terms of revenue per year, um, which would really help us um, maintain those mm -hmm. units in a quality way. Um, and they're much more expensive units to maintain, which we've talked about um, than like an apartment unit. So that's kind of a, I guess, walkthrough of this um, document about what we see as important to share in terms of the repositioning question in the context of our budget discussions. Um, Cynthia, before we move into Q&A, did you want to add anything that you noticed um, in this discussion with me? Cynthia, you got to take yourself off mute. There we go. Um, I don't think so. The sole purpose was just kind of to provide a really quick snapshot of kind of what the budget has been and what it really looks like. And 
the biggest takeaway is that expenses are exceeding revenue. Um, there's a backlog. There is the possibility of some funds coming in from Clay County, um, but it's not going to be a very sustainable practice for for the longer future. So really just wanted to kind of summarize everything and kind of put that in place to see why Don is looking at repositioning public housing. Does anybody have any questions for Don or Cynthia? Yeah, I've got a few. Okay. Um, first of all, in terms of um, the over reporting of rent income, how uh, explain in a little bit more detail how that occurred and and now that we've corrected um, whatever the practice was that that led to that what 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 was hud's reaction to that and what what is the amount the dollar amounts that we're talking about in terms of the over reporting of income of, of rent rent income yeah so a little more background on that it it a uh, housing authority of our size it's a very typical practice for us to have a fee accountant that we contract with um, because we we can't afford to have someone on staff to do our agency accounting. And so the information that we present to the fee accountant, you know, they're a little more removed from the inner workings of the agency, certainly, you know, in how housing authorities work. Um, and so the way that we broke down the information, um, the revenue coming in that they would see in our bank account, they kind of lumped it all in we would do a deposit that would have maybe a rent check on it and um, some information of other revenue. And they weren't separating that out correctly um, and our agency wasn't catching that. And so the impact to that is really, we ended up underfunded for our operating subsidy. Um, that because what HUD does is HUD, the theory behind funding for public housing agencies is, um, you get rent revenue, which is actually our number one source of revenue to run the agency. It's much higher than the subsidy we get from HUD. Um, but HUD's recognizing that because those rents are under the fair market rates, um, they're not what you would find, you know, in the rental market. They're they're way below that. They give us an operating subsidy to, you know, in theory, make up the difference. That subsidy is prorated, so it's always less than what we actually need. Um, but when they determine that operating subsidy, a big factor is what we're reporting in our audit for our rent revenue. And so this is something that um, I noticed a couple years ago. And so I was able to, in the last two years, work with HUD um, to basically correct our audited number that we reported for our rent revenue. Um, and I've spoken with our auditors about it. I've spoken with HUD about it. Um, and now then put in practices into place so that that doesn't happen again. Um, one of the things we have talked about as a board has been um, that if we did work with a fee accountant that specialized in working with housing agencies, um, that that probably would not have happened. Um, but it's also an internal mistake, um, first and foremost. Um, and so at some point we wanna take a look at you know the the pros and cons of who we who we're working with. Um, there's a lot of pros um, to be said, um, but that would be one safeguard into the future. Should things you know internal staff make a mistake, say ten years from now, um, that we wouldn't repeat that that mistake. So all of that is to say, when I give you kind of the big picture trend, I'm not going to take historical data really on our operating subsidy or our rent revenue. I did take quite a bit of historical data on our capital funding grant, but that historical data isn't very accurate because of those errors. Sure, I, I guess I understood all that, Don. My my question was more, what was the nature of the items that were reported as rent revenue that were not rent revenue? What was the numerical size of the errors that we were making? And what was HUD's reaction 
when um, we corrected the errors, what kind of pushback, if any, did we get from HUD? Um, there were no, there was no pushback from HUD. They understood what happened um, and simply said, yes, you know, fortunately they were willing to work with me um, even when I noticed it and the financial audit, which had already been submitted, had um, a very high rent revenue number. They not only didn't push back, they actually worked collaboratively with me for me to provide backup documentation to show that the audited number was actually higher than it should have been. So that was very helpful. I mean, from HUD's perspective, um, they didn't misappropriate, I mean, they didn't, um, I guess they underfunded us, so that's a concern from HUD. But I think they would have been much, it would have been a very different conversation had they overfunded us. Like if we were co collecting more operating subsidy than we should have been, that would be a whole different ball game. Um, that would have involved a lot more. You would have actually heard from HUD staff um, on that topic. Um, and you asked what it was typically, you know, reported as rent that wasn't rent. It was mostly tenant charges. Um, so when tenants pay, and that's why you'll see if you look at our financial statements, that number has really increased um, and the rent revenue has gone down. Um, but there's other examples too, even simple things like um, we get some commission for a pop machine we have in our building and we would, you know, have that put into rent revenue, which it, which it is not. Um, so just having it in the right line um, on our financial statements makes a huge difference ultimately with HUD. And, and big picture, um, I think two years ago, the, when I first started, the rent revenue reported was around $700,000. Now it's around 530,000, but okay. the caveat to point out with that is that we also implemented a homelessness preference in that time. And so the difference between those two numbers doesn't fully add up to. Uh, it's also, it's also decreased rent income. Right, because, because of, of rent income. So it's somewhere, sure. but it, it was a substantial amount that was, you know, not being reported correctly. Okay, that answers my question. I got a couple more, and so I'll I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, one of the items you, you mentioned too is on on some of the capital needs, is that there were some items um, that can be maintenance items that can be postponed, and <laughs> all of us that are homeowners or even renters realize that that's a reality. But it's also a reality that sometimes postponing these things can increase the cost. And so our, we're being very mindful of, of items that may be postponed that, that may also increase costs. Yes, if, if I you postpone them. I'm really glad you raised that though, because I mean, I do think we are very mindful of that. Um, I think it's something though that we need to continue to keep in the forefront. Um, and particularly with our capital funding grant, you know, that is budgeted separately from our op from our operating budget. And that is where it's a five year plan approved from HUD and the board approves all of that as well. And so when we're having conversations about what's on the list for the five year plan for capital needs, we really do need to be thinking about, you know, here's the physical needs assessment and what it said here's the money that we have. We don't have enough money to deal with everything, but how do we be as strategic as possible um, to, to put our money that will get us the biggest bang for our buck? Um, in addition to that, having good, competent, reliable maintenance staff who are, you know, have good systems in place, who are doing building rounds on a regular basis, who are communicating well with the executive director about what the needs are, that makes a huge difference as well. So those are things that we have to be very, very mindful of. Sure. And then my last question is kind of a devil's advocate question. And it's re regarding uh, the income and the, the increased revenue, let me put it that way, and the decreased um, um, regulations associated with repositioning. Um, the, the decreased regulations, 
regulations I, 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 I'm of a, a very mixed feelings when it comes to regulations. Regulations can be very burdensome and harmful to an agency when, when they're excessive and nonsensical. On the other hand, they also can be the last line of defense for our tenants and so on. And so, are we convinced that these reduced regulations are of the first type? The nonsensical ones and, 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 and right. not, not protections for our tenants. Right. And most regulations come with a story about someone getting hurt. And so regulations do play an important role. I will say that the regulations associated with the public housing program are much more significant than other affordable housing programs. Um, and I would describe many of them as nonsensical. Just to provide one example, um, every single time we do any kind of capital improvement, um, we have to um, wait you know, five to six weeks for the state historical office to send us documents showing that we're not making a modernization of a historical site even though you know and and every single time we have to show a map um drawing a line between moorhead and the closest coastal reef which is in duluth every single time so there's just many many things that the ones that i'm looking at that are being um lifted um are those kinds of regulations um and it is important too that I don't communicate in a way that says if we were to reposition that we will be free of regulations. That might be how it feels to me, but in reality, there's still lots of regulations in place. It's more just that some of those really challenging, burdensome regulations um, aren't in front of us. Um, even things like a REAC inspection is the physical inspection of the property shifting to an HQS inspection. We'd still have someone going through and looking at the, the condition of the property, but under a REAC inspection, I mean, it can get so extreme where even if you have sidewalk chalk that a kid drew on the sidewalk, they'll classify that as, as graffiti and you will be docked, which impacts your funding for that property. Um, so I just, that's an example too, where I find the HQS inspection much more, it meets, it meets um, the goals of what regulation is supposed to do and it doesn't go overboard um, like I think often the REAC inspection can. Um, and we are still going through a lot of the regulations. I know Cynthia has been working on that a lot. Um, so that might be something that we can take a closer look at to um, maybe share more information about that. Cynthia, what do you see in terms of, you know, important things you would raise as protections that exist in a post repositioning environment? Um, I feel like a lot of the regulations that are so strict, like your example with the react uh, inspections and the sidewalk chalk, that is totally happened. <laughs> um, it's pretty awful because, you know, you're thinking that you're nurturing children, you know, the creativity of children and things like that. And um, HUD sees it as damage to the unit or something like that. So just it's a simplification of a lot of things. So it's going to reduce the administrative time that's spent on it so that we can actually provide better services. Um, HQS in inspections usually just, they focus on what is safe and what is sanitary. And so when you're comparing that to the REACT inspections in terms of that chalk incident, you know, the inspector is going to be looking for if there are steps you know, along up to the unit, does that have a handrail? We're not going to be looking at the chalk or things like that. If there is excessive um, junk in the yard, which has happened, you know, and it's not going to be anything bad as a write up, but it will just be cited usually for a tenant to clean up so that it looks a little bit better. Um, but a lot of the things that are going to be coming up are they're just it's a way to make it easier and i know it kind of sounds scary because 
usually HUD doesn't try to make things easier. So it's just, it's kind of, there are going to be some things that I think we need to kind of delve a little bit deeper as to some of those other specifics, but the inspections and just the overall administration of the program in terms of funding is going to be a lot more simple. Does that kind of answer what you guys were looking for? Yep. Cynthia, I wonder, do you think that the differences in regulations, is some of that due to just how old the public housing program is um, compared to the other programs? Because it is hard to deregulate. Um, things tend to stack and accumulate over time um, versus starting fresh and building a program. Um, I'm not sure on that. Part of it is when you're repositioning public housing, um, your role as the landlord is a little bit different. And so I wonder, and that's my observation, is you're still a landlord, but you're not like a federally backed landlord. So part of it could be due to um, the progression of the public housing program and also, you know, just differences in that tenant landlord relationship as well. That kind of skews um, or makes it seem like some of the things that you're so used to are really crazy. But if you're just talking about a regular landlord that's in the regular market, you know, these aren't things that they have to do. And so it's kind of eliminating all of those. Any other questions? Don, could you slide that your slide up a little bit further? Just a little bit more so, so the bottom capital needs backlog shows. Oh, I see. I was going the wrong direction. And I, I try and use my mouse to move it and that doesn't work, obviously. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have the same problem, Greg. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So, uh, just for clarification, under the backlog for the immediate needs under capital needs backlog, where it says 1.8 million is is current, the way I understand it, and then 2.4 million in one to five years, that doesn't mean that 1.8 million is going to grow to 2.4 in one to five years. You're saying that's in addition to. Yes. Yeah, so when FOSS put together um, the physical needs assessment, they said kind of in zero year, like right now, we've identified 1.8. But my understanding is that the 2.4 is in addition to that. So if you wanted to look from zero years all the way to five years, you have to add those two numbers together. Okay. Any other questions for Don or Cynthia? All right, thank you very much for your work on this and the information. Uh, the next item under business is a request board approval for write off of debts. So, this is a common, um, I think we come at least once a year to the board with this, a common practice where um, if tenants leave us and they have money that they owe us, um, after two years, if we don't think we're going to be collecting on that, it's better for the agency to write that off um, because it impacts like our um, audit results, which then when we submit that to HUD impacts our FOS score, which is kind of HUD's um, way of grading us. Um, so we're bringing forward a list of seven individuals. Um, with how much money they owe that we do not anticipate getting back um, for a total of $5,334.75. Well, Don, I have one question on this. I mean, and I'm assuming that some of this is rent or damages is, is how they owe the money or rent they didn't pay. And just curious on how, how one gets that last one listed there. How, how does it get that high when it's 3,400 of the 5,300? If that's back rent, I would hope right. they weren't keeping that long for right. yeah, that was not back rent. And I'm actually very familiar with that situation. Um, we, we spent a lot of time with that person. 
this was someone in a scattered site. So I think that's very um, noteworthy in that the damage that you can do to a three, four bedroom home is much more substantial than an apartment unit. Um, and so Tony and I were regularly, you know, going out and doing housekeeping inspections, trying to work with the individual, um, tried mediation um, with Cap LP, um, and really even talked with finance um, with legal aid. Um, we really had no success working with that person. Um, and sometimes what we see is people who do that kind of damage um, may have other bills to pay. And so we do have a revenue recapture program where like if they get taxes coming to them, they get redirected to pay us what is owed, um, but we're not top of the list. And so we often don't see that money just given the barriers that people have. Um, and it is part of a larger conversation around um, how to support people to be successful in their housing. Um, I feel like our agency has made some pretty big strides with that. And we will continue to look at how we can improve in that area. But there will be always some people where we do everything we can and they just don't wanna meet us halfway. And I do think that was the case in this situation. So it was primarily, and I'm just gonna turn over to Tony quick to ask, I think it was primarily physical damage um, to the unit. You know who I'm talking about, right? I do. And it was flooring, doors that were busted, walls that were busted. Staff time to clean. Staff time to clean. Cleaning, time. Cleaning everything out is a big deal when people leave three, four bedroom homes full of stuff that we have to hold for 28 days. And then if they don't claim it, we have to get rid of it. So we have to rent like a $400, you know, bin and we have to haul everything out. So again, it's, it's interesting that example in light of the repositioning discussion. <laughs> Okay. Yep. I'm just thinking that, I mean, that hopefully, you know, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't look like it's very common, but hopefully there's, there's something in place that if we saw this happening, that we take care of it before it gets to that point, or maybe all the damage was done in a month, who knows, but okay. Any other questions for Don on these? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. I move to approve. Michael, are you still with us? I'm sorry, I stepped out for just a moment. No, it's okay. We're just looking for a second to approve the write off the debts. I second. All right, thank you. So. Uh, any other questions, comments? Bring none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Final um, item for under business is request board approval of the 2020 21 operating budget. Okay. So um, I worked with Greg and Alexa, our budget committee, um, pretty closely to bring a proposed budget to the board for review and approval. Um, just a reminder, we have to pass our next operating budget by the, by the year end, which is June 30th. Um, so we like to bring our first round to you in May. And if the board's happy, they can approve that budget today. Um, mm -hmm. But if you do want me to go back and do any changes, um, that can be done for June um, next month. Um, so I put together this budget briefing document just to give the board a general overview of our budget. Um, again, the fiscal year starts July 1st. It goes through June 30th. Um, there are multiple departments across our agency. Um, the budget I'm bringing forward um, combined revenue is $1.4 million and combined expenses is $1.3 million. However, we do spend much more time digging into the public housing department because that's the most significant department by far for our agency. Um, so you'll see like where it talks about public housing department, that's calling out that specific department. Um, it should be noted that the Ross grant um, that we currently have in place um, will expire in April of 21. 
And so this budget makes an assumption that we will get reauthorized funding for another three year cycle for Ross. Um, and I will be watching, there hasn't been anything from HUD yet, um, but I'm anticipating this fall an RFP opportunity to reapply for funds. Um, historically, um, getting, once you're, it's more competitive if you don't have a Ross grant to get into getting a Ross grant. So HUD will typically say, this is how much money we have for renewals. And if you're basic, you're meeting the basic qualifications, you're hitting the outcomes, um, and you fill out all the paperwork to reapply, you generally get renewed. And then they will designate a specific amount of money for new grantees, which was us three years ago, going on three years ago, um, where you can kind of break into that, that grant. Um, just a reminder, our operating budget is separate from our capital funding grant. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and that is budgeted out in our five-year plan that we submit to HUD and HUD has to approve it. Right now, we get a capital funding grant every year, but um, we have two years to sign a contract and four years to spend. So I'm generally working with upwards of three capital funding grants at a time that are open. Um, we currently have $832,000 in open capital funding grants uh, where we have plans in place to like work on elevators and replace our air handler unit, those kinds of things. And if completed this fiscal year, you know, we, the board has not made a decision about repositioning. Um, so this budget does not include anything related to repositioning scenarios. Um, so if we did reposition this fiscal year, we would have to uh, modify our budget. Um, the same would go for, you know, we've had some discussion about acquiring um, some units um, with Maple Court. Um, so that would also, you know, change our budget um, and we can bring, we can do an amended budget. We do have these financial data schedule lines. Um, I know Alexa, this is your first year looking at a budget. So that was probably your biggest learning curve is it's not very typical compared to other agencies, um, but we choose to organize our budget the same way that we will report our audit to HUD just to make it easier so that we don't have to rework the budget. Um, so I did include a link for a descriptor of those different lines so that you can see what HUD is saying that we report those expenses as. So this is a big picture of revenue and expenses specific to public housing. Um, one thing that's a little um, unusual this year is we do have this pending money from Clay County HRA and we don't know 100% um, that it will be approved by HUD we think the chances are very high that it will. And so just to be completely transparent with the board, I do have um, a view for you showing um, the revenue if those funds were approved, if that transfer was approved, and also showing you the revenue if it was not approved um, so that you can see the differences there. Um, in addition, we are currently running a shortfall in our current budget. And if you've reviewed the budget summaries that I send along with the financial statements, there's more comments about that, but it primarily is related to less revenue than we anticipated. Um, our expenses are projected to come in under budget, but our revenue is not. Um, so that's a shortfall. Again, it's my best projection of $35,000. I will say that that may be lessened somewhat due to some funding related to responding to COVID that the agency currently has access to. Um, but I think for to be more conservative is better. Um, and so then you can see what this budget would do um, factoring that in as well. Um, with budgets, you know, there's some costs that are very hard to have any influence over, like the cost of water and utilities. Um, but there are some costs that do really represent major decision points for the board. And so I wanted to call out some of those that are built into this proposed budget so you can understand that, you know, we're building in different, you know, decision points. Um, and those can be adjusted any which way. Um, of course, most of those res um, relate to the cost of staff. Um, and so this budget <clears throat> does factor in a step increase for eligible staff. That would be staff who are not at the top wage scale. Um, right now, two of our staff, um, one is right up, gonna be right at the top, so will not be eligible for an increase. And one is over the wage scale based on the market analysis that was done in 2016. So they 
in this proposed budget, if adopted, would stay at the same level while other staff would get a step increase. Um, I also did talk with the board about um, my step increase. I am not at the top, um, but would say to the board that while it's factored into the budget, <clears throat> a decision about my step increase can be made at my performance review. So it's really subject to performance. And I would also say the board could take into consideration for the director, the current economic crisis that we're in and make a decision based on that. Speaking of the economic crisis, um, this budget does not um, propose a cost of living adjustment. Um, so a cost of living adjustment takes the wage scale um, and actually bumps up everything by a certain percentage. Um, we adopted the wage scale we have right now in 2016. Um, and the COLA, there was a COLA that was implemented last year of 2%, I believe. And typically agencies go between no COLA to 3% is kind of what's most typical. Um, the rationale for no COLA has to do with looking at the market and what's going on. So um, the state of Minnesota's most recent economic forecast in February projected um, that wages overall will drop by 6%. Um, so that is the rationale behind not proposing a COLA. Um, COLAs do keep, the point of a COLA is to keep our wage scale competitive with the larger market so that we don't lose staff to a more higher paid job. This budget also factors in a 10% increase in employer contributions towards health premiums um, in January. We don't know what our premiums are going to do in January. Um, and so this is saying, you know, that we'd look at a 10% employer contribution increase. Um, what I've messaged to staff is that the board would make a final decision about what to cover with premiums um, once we actually know the premium number and maybe what's happening with the budget at the time. Um, but this budget, you know, would factor that in at this time. Um, and we do have, I'm sorry, the HSA contribution in July of 650 per staff. Um, and I would, you know, strongly advise that we, you know, continue to build that in because we did decide as a board when we kind of revamped the health insurance scenario to do a yearly contribution to kind of get people started with the HSA. And we broke that into January and July. July just happens to be our next budget year. So I think keeping with that um, based on that board decision, but this budget doesn't factor in additional HSA contribution amounts. So that again is something that the board can consider um, based on, you know, the finances. So I have to change the view here. Whoopsie, now it's upside down. You're not, the budget's not supposed to be upside down, Don. No, it's not. No, it's not. There we go. So this actually shows you the actual number. So that's my overview of the budget, but if you want to dig into the actual numbers, we do a spreadsheet so you can see each column has each department in it. Um, and I do highlight public housing again because it's such a significant department. And then you can see the combined numbers. This page is the revenue page. Um, and then it goes into the expense lines. And I do call out depreciation just with and without. Um, for budget planning purposes, I tend to separate depreciation out and just look at more what we have control over with our operating budget. And then I do have just additional detail on the rental assistance programs um, if you wanted to see a page that's more specific to them. So that is the proposed budget, um, but I will kind of certainly, Greg and Alexa may want to touch on other things that we discussed because they did the deepest dive or uh, Michael, if you have more detailed you know, questions about how do we get to this number, I do have some background information with me that I can provide. Any questions or comments?
Any questions or comments for Don on the, the budget? I have none. Okay. Yeah, it's been a, a good process. Again, I mean, Don does a great job walking us through and um, it's always a learning opportunity also. So, and I think one of the things, you know, we, uh, I shouldn't say we, should, I've struggled with a little bit is the, when we talk about the uh, increases for staff and that type of thing, it's, it's tough not to do some of those, but we have to take into consideration what's going on around us. So, I think, you know, being involved the last couple of years, um, it's, it's, it's gratifying to, to note the progress that we've made over the years because we, we didn't really start in a very good place. Um, and, and we're getting to a good place, I think. And part of that is <laughs> those tough decisions, like the one you point out, Greg. Um, and we want to do the best we can for staff. We want to do the best we can for the tenants and, and the, the properties and so on. But we have to stay within fiscal reality as, as well. Um, that's why I appreciate the hard work that, that Don does. And, and part of that is really getting into the details um, and, you know, pulling things apart and, and understanding the the realities of, of the programs themselves, but the realities of, of frankly, the, the federal government and the, 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 the fiscal realities that they face and, and what's coming um, down the pike in, in our future with them and, and anticipating things and, and making small adjustments within the programs and small adjustments within the budget and, and um, anticipating the future. And my personal opinion as a board member is that Don has done a pretty good job of that. And, and I think that um, we as board members have have done our best as well. And so I, I, I think the struggle will continue. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. And uh, new things will present themselves as, as time goes on. Uh, COVID obviously has presented us with uh, new challenges, um, both in terms of providing service, but I'm sure we'll discover some budget realities related to COVID as well. And uh, who knows what happens next year. So um, the point of my rambling is simply to say job well done. Michael and extra thanks to Greg and Alexa because um, it's a lot to wade through and I would say it's probably the most important decision the board will make all year um, and it's very challenging and and given our economic reality you know, public housing does already kind of exist in a fairly unstable funding platform that's hard to predict um, and with COVID um, it's even more unpredictable everything is. And so we'll just continue, you know, the board does have the power to make amendments to the budget um, based on, you know, what's coming in and the data. So we'll just continue looking closely at things um, every time we meet and when we send out the financial statements. All right, any other questions or comments? Not I'll entertain a motion for board approval of the 2020-21 operating budget. I so move. A second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're on to other business with executive director updates. Uh, my first update is way more fun to talk about than the budget. <laughs> Um, but it is kind of related to all of that. Um, there is a um, effort happening across Moorhead, and some of you may have heard about it, others may have not, about um, it's a Moorhead Community Resilience Task Force. Um, and this is something where Moorhead Public Housing Agency is a member and I am part of the task force. It started, I want to say, four months ago, give or take, um, but has really been picking up a lot of energy. Um, 
there's a number of organization organizational partners involved from the Moorhead Business Association to MSUM. Um, Concordia takes a really lead role um, and actually applied for grant funding through the Bush Foundation um, and was awarded you know, some significant grant funding. The whole concept with the Resilience Project is given the stressors um, that global warming and climate change is having on communities, that we really need to look at different ways of doing business and how do we adapt and really work together in a very intentional way to build a strong and stronger community. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, that's really right in there with the mix. We're in a public health crisis. And so um, how do we continue to um, have resiliency? Um, what do we need to be doing differently? How do we pivot? Um, and so all of that is very exciting. And I just wanted to say a little bit about that with the board today and also make sure that you know that they have launched a social media campaign. Um, so if you go on Facebook and you just search Resilient Moorhead, um, you will find there is a new Facebook page up and going. Um, Mayor Judd did kind of a overview promotional video um, and they're gonna be featuring different members of the task force. They recently featured Pastor Sue with Churches United. Um, I know they're also looking at bringing on some training about um, and having an entrepreneurial mindset, um, which should be exciting. So I can share that with all of you. And they also have started um, one project that they're working on that Moorhead Public Housing is one of the key partners has to do with our community garden. And so I know last month I told you that given COVID, we're kind of laying low with the garden. Um, and there is still some of that going on because we have a lot of safety concerns and trying to make sure that um, we're not bringing large people together. But we are going to be working through um, a person who's contracting with Concordia using those Bush Grant Foundation funds to look at ways to expand our garden, um, not this year, but doing things this year to position us for uh, garden expansion next year. And again, um, Working in partnership, the First Presbyterian Church in South Moorhead is situated near a number of folks who um, are low income, and we certainly are. And so it's also being really strategic about where gardens are placed in order to increase food access um, in the community. And then um, in addition to food access, just bringing people together. So I know one of our goals for our garden is to get to a place where we do have more community members um, present along with residents so that our residents um, to kind of some counteract some of the effects of more concentrated poverty where you have high numbers of people um, who are extremely low income living all in the same place that they have more opportunities for social interactions um, across the socioeconomic spectrum. So I probably talked longer than I should have, but that is a really exciting um, development um, my other update is also good news, and I know we've had a vacancy for our resident commissioner um, for quite some time. Um, and I've been in conversation with a resident um, who lives at Sharp View, um, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to meet with her in person because we we're just about to go out to coffee, and then COVID hit. Um, but I've sent her a lot of background information about Moorhead Public Housing, and have had conversations on the phone. Tony, our housing manager, has talked with her as well. Uh, her name is Rita Rith, and she is going forward to the city council tonight um, to, um, to, as an appointment from the mayor um, to be on our board. And so you guys should all have the opportunity to meet Rita hopefully next month, and we will finally have a full board of five voting members again. So that's very good news. Um, just a couple of additional updates. Um, I shared with you the poster competition that one of our um, families, um, a young kid, um, won the statewide narrow poster competition. So we were all jumping up and down here about that. Um, the mayor did send her specifically a letter. Um, so we really appreciate um, him taking the time to do that because it really is a big deal. Um, and so we'll keep you updated as her poster advances to the regional and hopefully nationwide competition. And then finally, just um, oh, a note that with Maple Court, um, you know, there's been a lot of hangups because on the, on the 17 of the units that we're not looking at purchasing, but the city is, 
there's a lot of um, legal things in place. Um, and so it, it gets kind of complicated with the financing and we've had to do a lot of work with the state to understand that. They have submitted a request for action with the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency that gets very specific about what their questions are. And MHFA has 30 to 90 days to respond to that request for action. So I'm hoping it's closer to 30 than 90, but I do think the answers to that will have a big, play a big role in us determining our way forward with looking at potentially purchasing Maple Court, um, half of those units along with the city. So more to come on that. And then finally, just a reminder that our June meeting is a week earlier than usual. Um, so we'll be coming back together again might feel kind of fast, um, but June 16th is our next meeting. So I just want board members to keep that um, in mind um, for our next meeting. Those are my updates. All right, a lot of good information there. So thank you for that. Um, anybody else have any updates? Uh, yeah, I actually have two. Um, I unfortunately resigned my position as a board member of Beyond Shelter because my uh, position as a board member on Moorhead Public Housing put them out of balance on their board um, for their Choto status. The city of Fargo raised objections uh, because of my status as a public official. And so a consultant that we worked with um, did some research and said that it was an unresolved gray area. <laughs> it's certainly not the first time I've been associated with a gray area, I guess. But because of that uh, issue and not wishing to put um, Beyond Shelter in a, uh, a, a danger, of losing their Choto status. I resigned my position um, last week. And so I uh, am no longer a board member, but um, am still associated with them in an advisory capacity. And it was kind of a sad uh, board meeting um, last week, but uh, still um, they are accessible to us, uh, you know, um, as we, look towards our acquisition and any other projects that we're looking to do in, in the future. And so that's one announcement. And then the other thing I wanted to say, though, is uh, in my new retail venture in the drum shop, we reopened last week and had our our best week ever. And so that was exciting. But one of the drum head companies, um, Evans Drumheads, that I I'm a retailer for during the shutdown um, changed or one of their factories went into production of face shields because the mylar material they use is the same material used for face shields. And so I've got a shipment of FDA approved face shields coming in this week. So if any of your agencies has a need for face shields, um, I know where you can get some. Sounds good. Congratulations on the store and um, sorry about the Beyond Shelter um, board. That's that's definitely their loss and I'm glad we get to keep you. So, yeah, well, yeah, I could have made the other choice too, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I uh, am committed here. Right. When you started out, I, that's the first thing I thought is Michael is leaving. But thank you for not doing that. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, you're stuck. <laughs> no, no. All right, no return attorney's reports. I don't think we have an attorney on here. So there's nothing else. Our meeting is adjourned and we'll see everybody in June. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye now. Bye. Thank you, everyone.